Well, good morning, Victory family and friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and we are glad in it. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. As I shared uh, in an email and, you know, on social media um, on New Year's Eve, my prayer is that 2021 uh, be blessed according to Psalm 1's definition, um, that we would all find our delight in the word, Uh, our delight in the law of the Lord, if you will, meditating on it day and night, such that when the winds of adversity uh, blow, as they did in 2020, as they do every single year, and 2021 will be no different, I'm sorry to say, but, um, but that we will be like trees planted by streams of water whose leaves do not wither. That's the good news, that we can yield fruit in season, and out of season for that matter, because we are in Christ Jesus. We know the winds of life uh, are going to blow, but the joy of the Lord isn't um, dependent on the circumstances and those winds. And so again, this is the day that the Lord has made and we rejoice and we are glad in it and happy and blessed new year. Uh, And what better way to experience that being blessed y'all than doing so in community? Uh, Beginning January 10th, next Sunday, we are going to resume our victory groups uh, and we'll be going back to sermon-based groups um, so as to facilitate a church-wide focus uh, to to maximize the accessibility of all who would like to either lead a group or to participate in a group. Uh, For those with us, you know we're coming off of some really neat book studies going back to even last summer when we read Color of Compromise and Wiki Church. Um, and then this past fall semester, it was a bit of an atypical semester in that we, uh, each leader, uh, followed up the book study on, on you know, discussing the complicity of the American church in racism uh, with more meaningful discussions as they saw fit for their group. And so now we're, we're simply coming back together uh, as a church through focused study, sermon-based study, and discussions that really extend the sermon in meaningful ways for every single group. And so I invite you uh, over this next week as we update the website with uh, who will be leading next semester, I invite you to, to, to plug in in the ways that you can. If you are new to us, all of the sermon-based study questions are on our website. Um, if you've ever participated, though, in um, in our victory group. So you know that those questions are just starting points. Uh, and, and what I love about the sermon-based questions is, is it doesn't matter if you're a biblical scholar, right, on the order of like uh, James Cone or A.W. Tozer, or if you just picked up a Bible yesterday. Um, these guiding questions help us all in our personal walk with Jesus Christ. And more importantly, they help us grow together. Uh, Apostle Paul says a little bit about that in all of his epistles, that we are built together such that the Holy Spirit can dwell in us uh, individually, yes, but even more so collectively. Um, And to that end, each of the questions can be tailored or seen through the lens um, that that applies to your particular group, whether you're college students, your retirees, your, uh, you know, men, women, couples, singles, whatever, it can be sort of tailored to and seen through those particular lenses. Uh, And so, again, I I invite you, I admonish you to join us there. Um, Secondly, uh, the week of January 11th through the 15th, which is also next week, we are going to be fasting together. We uh, are a part of a larger family of churches called Every Nation, and every year we kick off the year with a corporate fast. And so I'm also going to put that link here, uh, a lot of posting of links in the chat for me this morning, but I want you to be able to have... uh, the opportunity to join us in that corporate fast. Now, traditionally, and, 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 and the, the, what I posted there, the link will talk more about this, but I'll just say briefly, traditionally fasting has to do with turning our plate down, uh, praying, spending more time with God during those moments where we would typically be eating. Uh, but you know me well enough by now to know that I'm not asking any of you Um, to not eat should you need to eat to take medicine or what have you. I'm not telling you to go get sick while trying to fast. The point is, uh, based in scripture, is for us to consecrate ourselves, to set ourselves aside, to put this here flesh aside 
um, under subjection and remind it who's really in charge of our lives. So maybe it's social media right now. Maybe it's um, sweets. Uh, maybe it's TV. Maybe it's whatever it is that has a significant presence in your life. Food typically does, which is why that's a, a, an often uh, often what we go toward. And, and certainly it appears in scripture a number of times um, that we fast in that way. But whatever occupies a significant presence in your life, you know what that is. Um, take that out next week and just say, you know what? God's always been in charge. Um, this isn't a bad thing that I'm putting down, but this week I'm just reminding myself that I am committed to Jesus. And pray with us. We'll have um, some more information forthcoming. Our prayer team, we're going to actually have a call every single day with them that you can hop on if you want to pray corporately with us. Um, and certainly in your individual prayer time, please be leaning in. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, this is the first Sunday, uh, which means we're going to be taking communion together today. Uh, and so if you don't have those elements, you know, take your phone, your tablet, your laptop, however you're watching this, and go grab your, your crackers or your piece of bread and, and some juice or whatever you can find such that we can uh, have symbolically uh, the blood and the bread that we'll remember together. Uh, and in this virtual space, we're doing so now at the conclusion of the sermon, so you have some time. Um, to do that. And lastly, before we jump in, th this, this, today's January 3rd, it is the two-year mark of when victory was launched. Can you just praise God in your living room for that, uh, your kitchen, bedroom, wherever you might find yourself? Praise God with me for us making it to the two-year point um, if there were ever a church plant template for launching and being successful, we didn't follow it. <laughs> we had a pandemic, <laughs> and a pandemic in anyone's church planting plan is just d disastrous. And yet God has been with us since before 2019. Let's be real. The church plant started in 2014. We just started meeting in 2019. And because God has been in it, there is no weapon formed against that shall prosper, not even a pandemic. And so the church now, we've just got to know ourselves and who the church is beyond the four walls, which was always the purpose anyway. The pandemic, though, has just helped us to realize it. And I just want to say, Lord, I thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. And we don't take for granted that we are here lifting your name up as a corporate community that just three or four years ago was not here. I'm grateful for that and we can preach and praise on that all 29 minutes of which I've taken up nine already because I'm just excited and thrilled and incredibly honored to participate in the Lord doing what he does here on earth as is his will in heaven. I'm honored that we get to participate in that process. And so thank you. I'm grateful for all of you. I can't begin to name names, but but we've had the privilege of planting seeds here in Charlottesville soil over these last couple of years. And I'm trusting God for wisdom for all of us uh, in how to water those seeds and who may not even be here now that God will send to help water those seeds because it's bigger than me. It's bigger than us. God is at work and no doubt he provides for uh, the vision that he's given. And so uh, we hold with an open hand everything that he allows us the privilege of stewarding and participating in. And so to God be the glory. And that is a good segue, I believe, to the sermon series that we are kicking off this morning that is going to be entitled Awesome God. Is not God awesome? Again, in concert with the Every Nation Prayer Fast, which is entitled Awesome God, we're going to preach about how awesome God is all month long. Uh, and in this series, we're going to examine the awesomeness of God through the encounters of men and women in Scripture uh, and, and the encounters that they had with God. And in, in each of those instances, there's a particular name of God that, that captures what God revealed about himself in the encounter. And we're going to walk through some of those names. And so today we're going to look at the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 35, uh, we're going to look at verses 9 through 15. Genesis chapter 35, verses 9 through 15. And before we read, let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I am grateful for your presence. Grateful 
for who you are. Grateful that we can call you Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us this morning to, to ingest and digest your word in such a way that it's applied to our lives. I pray that you would open up our eyes so that we may see all that is here for us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 35, we'll look at verses 9 through 15 over the next, I usually say 29 minutes, which doesn't leave me a lot of time. I might go a little beyond that 11 o'clock time this morning because I just had a few things this morning to share prior to jumping into the word. Genesis chapter 35, uh, we'll read verses 9 through 15. After Jacob returned from Paddan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob. But you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac, I also give to you. And I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked with him. Jacob set up a stone pillar at the place where God had talked with him, and he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Thank you, Lord, for the word. Of God. Two points that I want to highlight along the way. Um, one, consistently intentional. And two, when struggle becomes purpose. I, I've never been, uh, I've never been the handy type. Uh, I'll do it when I have to do it. It, it, it uh, put the batteries in, if you will. <laughs> I, I can do that. Um, I, I can change a light bulb real well, too, right? I can do those things when I have to, but I'm not the type that's going to seek out projects, right, to take my mind off things, right? Like if if, if my wife, if Taylor wants a, a dry erase wall, which, which she did, I'm going to research the kind of paint to use, and we're going to get it done, right, so that she can work on her, her book that she's putting together. I'm on it. Um, but I'm not necessarily waking up thinking about uh, gutting houses, right? I'm not, I'm not waking up thinking about regrading our front lawn and how fun that would be, right? Anything like that. <laughs> the best deliveries, in fact, and we, we often get packages to our house, like houses, like I'm sure, our house, like I'm sure you do. And the best ones for, for, for me, if I'm honest, are the ones that, that say no assembly required. Um, that is a Merry Christmas. Um, for 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 me, um, that being said, I remember getting up on our on our roof maybe a year or so ago uh, because some tree limbs had fallen on the roof and they had punctured uh, the shingles and and we had some extra um, shingles here in the home. So I thought, you know what, I'll just go up, take the ones that were kind of damaged, and I'll resecure these new shingles that 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 we have. No, you know, no big deal. And so I did that um, as I saw fit and understood to do that. Um, and things were good, right? Like I, I did it. We saved some money and I felt like I got this <laughs> until I didn't. Um, uh, we were away on a little bit of a break and vacation I, and I had some guys come by and, you know, check on the house. Uh, and they sent me this video of, it was during a really bad rain. And, and so the video you see on our little carport, the water is just, <laughs> It's just coming through. And so I said, oh, oh, okay, um, help me. I got on the phone. I called uh, the roofing company. And the bad part was I already knew these folks. Like I had a relationship with them already. So it wasn't like a cold call. And, of course, the guy is like, man, we've always been here. You could have called us to start. Look, don't do that again. Don't get up. Just don't get on the roof. Just call us. And I thought about, in, in, in reflecting on that story, uh, you're welcome if you needed encouragement, you know, in your own, you know, DIY projects. There, there you, you just be encouraged with my uh, crazy, terrible experiences and, and 
uh, and performance, if you will. But I think about how in life, um, all of us can make an even bigger mess in trying to do it our way <laughs> when we could just call up God and say, God, you already know. Help. Help. And in our text that we read this morning, we see the conclusion of a story uh, uh, of a man who had made such a mess of his life that really he just needed to start over. Like that's what the guy said, man, we just need to do this again. I don't know what you did. Right. And this the, the man that we're discussing, Jacob, in this story, he just needed a, a do over. But the problem was wherever he went, there he was. Whatever house we moved to, there I am with my handy self. How does a person start themselves over? And what made it worse for Jacob was that his very name told his story before he even had a chance to live differently. His name was Jacob, deceiver. God met Jacob in his mess and he made him a promise. In the book of Genesis, uh, the writer is not identified, but it's, it's a kind of agreed upon, Moses wrote the, the larger part of Genesis, and the book of Genesis shows God's intent has always been to be in relationship with his image bearers, to, to bless them, to increase them, to make them a blessing. And so this particular text is demonstrating God's consistency toward that goal, despite people's, you and me, not unlike Jacob, despite people's obvious shortcomings. And this is where you would turn to your neighbor, and in this case, maybe text a neighbor or chat a neighbor and just tell them, I am so glad that my past mistakes do not disqualify me for God's blessing. I know I'd be in some trouble. If so, I imagine you too. We all would. And in our text, beginning at verse 9, we see God is interacting with Jacob again. It's actually the seventh mention of God initiating interaction with Jacob, whether in the past through a dream or angels of the Lord or, or Jacob just hearing God. And, and the question I had, and I hope you ask yourself questions when you read scripture, I said, God, wh why does God keep pursuing Jacob? Why does God keep blessing Jacob? And this text, I believe, illuminates God's intent again to still bless even in the midst of humanity's choices for or against God and his ways. God is consistently intentional in pursuing us. Which reminds me of the psalmist in, I believe, Psalm 8, where he says, Who am I that you would even be mindful of me? God is consistently intentional. Why does God keep pursuing Jacob? Because God's pursuit of Jacob has more to do with God than it does have to do with the man that Jacob is. God has promised to bless Abraham's family. So he's pursuing Jacob here to keep his promise. It's based in a covenant, a covenant that God made with his forefathers and not on the merit of Jacob's behavior. Side note, do not mistake God's blessing for God's endorsement. God is simply a promise keeper, and I am so glad that he is, that his mercy and his grace continues to chase me down every single day, though every single day I fall short of his glory. He's consistently intentional. And this, in verse 10, is the second time that God is telling Jacob that he's getting the, a new name. He's going to get this new name, Israel. The first time God said it to Jacob was in chapter uh, 32. And then he even gave an explanation as to, uh, you know, Jacob struggling with God and, and with humans and now had overcome. This time, there is no explanation of his struggle. It just says, you're no longer going to be called Jacob, but Israel meaning God fights, or some interpretations, uh, uh, well, some will interpret as, as meaning he fights with God. Bottom line is, just as God uh, renamed Abram to Abraham, Saul to, to Paul, uh, uh, Simon Peter's name, like we, God's work in our lives can overcome anything from our past. That's good news. We can have a new name. Your past does not have to determine your future. And then God tells Jacob that he is the title of our message, which I may or not have mentioned. He tells Jacob that he is El Shaddai, God Almighty. El Shaddai is 
the Hebrew name. And, and yes, it's not by the Hebrew or Greek of God. It's by the grace of God. But I'm grateful as appropriate for the Hebrew and the Greek because it, it helps us unpack a little bit more. In this case, the name of God. Again, that we'll be walking through the different names or some of them throughout the month of, of, of January. He says, he is El Shaddai, God Almighty, meaning the true God who is over all. Which, for reference, further study, victory group time, if you will, is the same name that God used when he spoke to Abraham in Genesis 17. It's the same way Isaac described God when he blessed Jacob after sending him away to find a wife in chapter 28. And then God, the Almighty, the El Shaddai, goes on to say this, Be fruitful and increase in number. Which recalls his, his words to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, recalls his words to Noah in Genesis 9, recalls his words to Abraham when he promised to make him a great nation in Genesis chapter 12, recalls his words to Sarah to be the mother of nations in chapter 17. But why is God calling him here to be fruitful and to multiply? Another question we might ask of the text, and there are many. Why? Jacob had like... Oh, more kids than I we have. We got three. He had like 11 kids already at this point, right? The, and, and I think the rest of verse 11 helps us with that question. He says, a nation and a community of nations will come from you and kings will be among your descendants. In other words, I'm bigger than what you can see, Jacob. It's bigger than you. There's so much more that God sees. God sees more in this here city of Charlottesville than what all of us can see with our natural eye. Victory Church is more than what I can even comprehend. I'm like a little blip on the screen of, of this vision of Victory Church to see people reconciled to God and to each other. The team that you're leading, that victory group you're leading or participating in, it is so much more than what you can see. There's more to your family, your marriage, than what meets your eye. It's why we have this secret weapon called faith that we all get the privilege of exercising. And in many ways, Jacob here, he's kind of needing a, uh, it's, it's kind of like his starting over story. After struggling literally from the womb, where he struggled with his brother in the womb, uh, he later struggled with his father's love. And, and in Genesis 28, if we go back a bit, Jacob is now running away, afraid for his life because of the things that he had done. Like lying to his blind father to steal from his brother. <laughs> And as such, this prophetic word over his life competed with others, uh, others' thoughts about him and with his own manipulative motives to achieve. Can anybody identify? God, are you really saying that about me? <sighs> God sees Jacob's struggle, though, and he comes down to meet him. And this struggle of Jacob, just as some more context it, it really mirrors or parallels Israel's struggle in the wilderness would they pursue life and blessing on their own or would they trust God and follow him in his way the almighty's way El Shaddai's way and do not you and I have the same struggle we're no different we're no different but the good news the good news is that God is no different either Scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He enters our struggle, pursues us, and then enters our struggle, offers us his presence and his blessing. But here's the catch. We got to say yes. <laughs> we have to, if you will, build our stone pillar and pour out our drink offering on it. God's invitation is real and it's extended to each of us. In, in the very real person of Jesus Christ, who came down to earth to enter our struggle, and he is here, ever present now, to enter whatever struggle we find ourselves in. Now, we may not build a stone pillar like Jacob did, right? But our response can be to turn to Jesus and repent of our building our own lives. Instead of pouring out a, a, a drink offering, we confess to the Lord. You are El Shaddai. You are God Almighty. You are God all by yourself. <clears throat> and God Almighty, he knew, he knew Jacob's struggle. He knows your struggle. He knows my struggle. And he stepped in and he wants to step in 
and offer a different way. God allowed Jacob to see a connection between heaven and earth in Genesis 28 and the activity of God and his angels. He spoke to Jacob, telling him he's the same God who made the same promise to Abraham and Isaac and said he would give that same promise to Jacob. He told Jacob, I'll be with you. I'll watch over you. I'll bring you to the place of promise. <clears throat> God is entering into Jacob's struggle and in the end, transforms Jacob's struggle into purpose that had a legacy well beyond him. Second point I'm highlighting, God wants to turn your struggle into purpose. But as I reference, he gives us a choice. And that choice is to trust God, to trust him, to surrender our lives to him, to allow God to make us new, give us a new name, a new hope. His intent has always been to bless us. But it's through his presence and wisdom, not through our own. If we couldn't already tell, Jacob's story is ours. It can be any of our story. How many of you have found yourself seeing your methods of living as better, uh, a better route, if you will, than living for God and doing life as his word describes? How many of you have found yourselves making your own way of life, whether in, in seemingly big or small ways, but you're making your own way of it. <laughs> you're putting those shingles on the roof that might look good for a little while. <laughs> Jacob was born with hopes and dreams and frustrations and the inability to carry out his purpose in his own strength, just like you and me. His efforts, Jacob's, were, were, were self-centered, destructive to the relationships around him, and yet he just didn't know how to live any differently. Jacob, not unlike you and me, tried to fulfill God's word and promises on his own terms. With strategy even and deception. And I don't know about you, but God, I am tired <laughs> of trying to live life on my own terms. And But what I am grateful for, good news, is that God continued to pursue Jacob. And he continues to pursue you and to pursue me. And what I imagine today is a church, a church who this year, 2021, will renew your individual and our corporate collective commitment to relying on El Shaddai, God Almighty, to do what only God Almighty can do through you, through me, and through us. God's offer to us, y'all, is it's the same as his promise is to Jacob. The question is, will we turn to him? Like really turn to him? Will we lay down our agenda? Will we say yes to God's agenda? And can I interrupt myself here for a moment and to say, that is not always going to feel good because Lord knows we are some strong J's on the Myers-Briggs. I am Myers-Briggs personality inventory. Uh, the Enneagram, it could mean something else, but we, we are what we are and I love a good plan. But turning to Jesus says, God, it's not a, it's your agenda. What is that? What are you calling me to right now in this season? What do you have to say? And if you are above ground and you're hearing my voice right now, the good news is it's not too late. Regardless of the thoughts that chirp away in your brain from time to time and likely get worse at night, right? Around, it's too, too far gone. You've done, you've, you're worse than Jacob, if you will. If you're hearing me, it's not too late. You can have forgiveness through repentance and confession right now. We all can have a new start wherever you find yourselves. And how do I know? Certainly all of scripture is replete with stories like Jacob's, but he also gave me personally a new start. And if you don't know all of scripture from Genesis to Revelation, you know your story. And in my story, it was 1992 when I took that long walk down the aisle of Morningstar Full Gospel Assembly in the Bronx, New York. We used to walk down the aisle back then. And the Bible that I read says he's no respecter of persons, meaning if God did it for me, he can do the same for you. Jesus Christ entered this earth to make that promise a reality. 
And like Jacob, we're offered the promise of God Almighty, El Shaddai, the God over the whole entire world has made it possible for his presence to be with us, to not leave us, to bring his blessing so that we can bless others and have eternal impact. So much more than what we could ever see. But we have to say yes. We have to give him our struggle. Stop living life on our terms. And it's 11 o'clock. We're going to get to communion. So bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you. <clears throat> we repent today for living our lives on our own terms. We turn to you. We, we confess before you that we fall short every single day. And we embrace afresh, afresh your presence in our lives. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for relieving us of the striving, of the struggle for significance, for forgiveness, for hope, for peace, and giving us the privilege of finding it in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, I hope we all prayed it, but if you prayed it for the first time, let us know. There's a connect card link in the chat and you can, it's an electronic connect card where you can let us know about that decision and allow us the privilege to walk out next steps with you and what it looks like to walk out this life of faith. Now I want to shift gears and I pray that you'll stay with me and with us in our virtual community here to partake of the Lord's table. Um, communion as we do every first Sunday here at Victory Church. Um, communion is a celebration of the gospel. Um, the gospel being that, <laughs> firstly, it's good news. That's the gospel. And the good news is that Jesus took on our sin. It was ours sin. And he received the wages for that sin. The wages being death. <laughs> God is a God of justice. Talk about that more in February. The God of justice. And so our sin, it needed to have been paid for. But Jesus says, no, it's not even mine. It's your sin, but I'm going to pay it. That's good news. Because now you and I get to be made whole through him. In all of our brokenness and imperfect nature, we get to be made whole through the sacrifice done on the cross. The work's already been done. And so our participation now in communion is for anyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the good news. You can do that right now. If you prayed that prayer, it's done. The Bible does, though, say in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that we should not take communion in an unworthy manner or in an irreverent manner. And so what we like to do when we take communion is just take a moment and just examine our hearts. Just ponder Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and approach this table with reverence confessing anything we need to confess certainly and and just acknowledging the gravity of that sacrifice take a moment and examine your heart the bible says uh, also in first corinthians chapter 11 beginning at the latter part of verse 23 that on the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Verse 25 says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your shed blood on Calvary's cross. It is through your sacrifice that we are able to be saved from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, 
and someday from the presence of sin. Thank you today for salvation. Thank you to get today for wholeness that we find in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hmm. The song being played, it says, The blood will never lose its power. There's not a pandemic. There's not a challenge to be faced in 2021 that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ cannot overcome. And we are grateful for the promise of Jesus's return. Family, I love you. Um, I'm going to conclude here. Uh, but just be encouraged today that the God of all gods, the living God, the God Almighty, El Shaddai, he's present with us to enter our struggles, but he's not a bully. He invites us to say yes to him. And so let us just say yes every single day of our lives. And with that yes, I'm declaring victory. And so as is our admonishment every single week, let's live in victory, victory family and friends. Love y'all much. Be blessed.